Hi everyone, um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar this afternoon. Um, my name is Freya and I'm a campaigns officer uh, here at the Children's Society and I'm really thrilled to be here today in partnership with the Child Poverty Action Group and Children North East um, and with also with our fantastic panel. Um, we were really blown away by the response we've had to this webinar. We've had hundreds of signups um, and we really want to say thank you for taking time out of hectic days to learn about how you can build a uniform policy which is a fair price for children and their families. Um, our campaign for affordable uniforms was started in 2014 by a group of young people um, and in recognition of that we wanted to kick off today's webinar with reflections from a young campaigner called Alicia. felt like it was a relief that some that an organization was actually about to do something or attempt to do something because it's an issue that has been around for years on end and so many of my friends had had some like, had experiences with school, school uniforms whether it be too expensive or it be too specific or suppliers being too far away that it was just inaccessible to get to so finally having a big organization like the children's society listening meant that maybe something might get done and whether it maybe not be helpful for us but helpful for the next generation of kids they're going to go through similar struggles to us changing the mindset that you have to remember that behavior management doesn't come before kind of being there for a child like a child's well-being and kind of how they are whether it be looking physically in a uniform or whether it be the mental aspect of not having the correct uniform is so much more important than putting them in isolation and putting them in a detention. I think that's what's so important about having a school uniform is because it brings you all together and there's then it doesn't bring like a conflict of interest between kids and like being like oh I've got more money than you and what like that having the same school uniform means that financial burdens isn't in place and for a lot of kids up and down the country especially with the cost of living crisis like having one sort of financial burden taken out the window helps so much and the mental pressure and the kind of the well-being I believe that every school has the chance and the opportunity to change the uniform policy for the better and allow so many children to thrive in a place where it's safe and there is no pressure of how they look in a uniform like there is so much of a chance that you guys have and you guys should grab it while you can um thank you so much again Alicia, for sharing those reflections i've heard some um comments that the sound quality wasn't very good which is a shame because i set it up accurately um, but I'll send on a link in the chat so people can follow up and watch the video um, later to make sure they're getting it in full quality um, and I'd like to introduce Mark Crossell who's our CEO who's going to talk a little bit more about how the Children's Society came to campaign on this. Thank you Freya and good afternoon everybody and thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us for this webinar today and we'll get the, the link for the video around so you can watch it. Um, I'm joining this call um, as the Chief Executive of the Children's Society I'm very proud of that but I'm also joining as a school governor uh, of a fabulous uh, school in Hampshire, and I think one of our uh, senior team is on the call today, so hi to Ollie. Um, what our team do is we work across the country with some of the most disadvantaged young people and, and their families. We work with around 50,000 young people every year, whether that's young people with mental health issues, young people living in poverty, young people facing abuse or exploitation from county lines, gangs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We're working right across the country, and, and what we try and do is take the voices of the young people we work with and then the stories of what they're experiencing and our fabulous research and policy teams work out what needs to change in the systems around those young people to enable uh, future young people not to fall into the issues that our team work with. And it's an ex utterly extraordinary story how this school uniform law came to be. It started in 2014 in a children's society group when a young person told us that his mum had gone into significant debt in order to pay for his blazer for his school. At the same time, other colleagues were telling us that young people were being excluded from school because they were wearing the wrong uniform, frequently because families couldn't afford it. And we were then seeing that those young people who were excluded from school were then being uh, victims of criminal exploitation uh, from uh, criminal groups. And so what we began to wonder was, could it be possible to, to change the law on school uniform and bring the cost of uniform down and make it more affordable? And that led to a campaign called Cut the Cost, led by our campaigns team, um, which involved thousands of people contacting their MPs. 
But the game changer for this campaign came when the remarkable Mike Amesbury uh, topped the poll in the private members ballot at the House of Commons. And one of our team um, suggested cheekily that maybe school uniform might be an issue he might like to think about. And Mike, who I'm delighted to say is on this call, uh, skillfully piloted a private member's bill through Parliament. And private member's bills have got about as you know, much chance of becoming law as pigs flying. And so it's a sign of Mike's skill and the team around uh, him and, and from our team here that we persuaded the government to back this bill. And, and I'm delighted that the Department for Education are on this call today. And when I think about it, the voice of that young person in Manchester telling us that their family were in debt right the way through to Her Majesty the Queen signing a bill into law is an extraordinary journey. And, and I am incredibly proud of the work that our team have done with Mike and many, many others on this call to get to where we are today. Because it's the voice of young people, it's the voice of their families affecting significant systems change. And it feels at this particular time, as we're in the middle of this extraordinary um, difficult time, and there's a cost of living crisis, it's biting the poorest families in this country really hard. It feels this is a really key time where we can do this and, and schools can make uniform more affordable and we really can make a difference to the budgets of families right around the country. So I am absolutely delighted that we are uh, helping this webinar today and I'm delighted you've taken the time to come. And with fur further ado, I'm delighted to pass you on to the MP who made this happen. Uh, I have a pleasure to introduce Mike Amesbury, the Labour MP for Weaver Vale. Thank you, Mark. And, um, and, and the team, certainly the Children's Society, um, um, and actually everybody on this, on this call um, today. Um, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very, very proud that I was able, with others, very, very importantly, with others to, to bring those voices, you know, the young lad in Manchester, and I speak as someone that was born in Manchester, it was a young lad in Manchester, as well in that journey, but bring it alive in terms of Parliament, through all those considerable hurdles over a, a two year period, when I uh, um, won the ballot, which is literally a lottery, private members bill, and the higher up the pile you come, the, the better. So I'll come out, I'll come out num number one. And then I was, um, I, I was bombarded in a very good and nice sense um, um, by, campaign organisations, people with incredibly worthy causes um, um, up and down the land. Um, um, certainly um, Mark and, 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 and the whole team um, um, spoke, spoke very loud and very importantly, the young people did about cutting the costs of school uniforms. And actually, um, is knocking on an open door. I know there'd be the head teachers, other stakeholders that are working in the broader school family sector um, um, on, on this call. And there's so many of you um, um, have been doing the right thing over a considerable uh, number of years by, by children, parents and carers. Um, but undoubtedly, there were others where school uniforms, in some cases, had become a measure to sometimes um, um, let 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 let's say discourage people from applying for um, certain schools, and actually I've seen it in my own constituency where children and um, parents and carers have actually faced the indignity of their children not going to a school because they've had ill-fitting uniform or they couldn't replace something when they've grown as children do at a rather a rather fa fa uh, at fast pay of course um schools should be about a ability to do and not ability to pay um what i will state and i've stated from the outset actually that school uniform I'm pro school uniform i think school uniforms are a great a great leveler it's quite quite a popular slogan, isn't it? I think they, they they really are. But what this bill does, it puts things centre stage. It ensures that affordability, cost, cutting the costs, so it's inclusive, is that is that key key driver. Uh, got it through all those um, stages in terms of the um, parliamentary process. So from um, second reader, along the way, I had a, 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 a lot of a lot of help. Um, in terms of the children's society and other stakeholders as well, including some of our friends in the media, particularly the Mirror Group, 
um, who, who, who endorses part of their campaign. It was good to see the uh, head teachers and the teachers union united <laughs> together on this on this issue, and and and, and I, I do thank them for their help. And actually, it also gave me the opportunity to say to um, uh, the Secretary of State at the time, Gavin Williamson, and indeed Nick Gibb, who you know I will give considerable credit to, by the way, who um, uh, works um, not 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 only kind of front of house in the chamber, but um, behind the scenes. And certainly there's department officials on this call today who've been incredibly helpful. Um, I've never spent so much time as an opposition MP in the Conservative Whip's office, um, um, but th that was necessary to get through um, second reading, committee stage, um, and certainly uh, uh, third reading report stage, and in both houses. I must pay credit as well to uh, Baroness Lister, um, um, who, who led the charge in the in the in the Lords as well. So so what what does the the the, the bill the bill do? Well, I mean, I was provided actually with some some brilliant support and evidence in terms of the costs of uniforms. I've seen it in my own patch, I've seen it nationally. I mean, we're looking at, uh, I think, a thousand parents that the uh, Children's Society surveyed, they updated that survey as the, as the bill went through the house. And you're looking at 337 pounds. That was average for a secondary school and 315 for a primary school. Just not, not acceptable. Um, um, it, it, it actually seemed with the drive for academization, it's a reality, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's with us. But, you know, if, if a child walked, either brand <laughs> the child in terms of the uniform um, um, or put a logo. And of course, this, this, this drove up costs tremendously. So in terms of the bill, um, that will ensure that um, branding and certainly emblems are kept to to a minimum, uh, there's considerable debate behind the uh, behind the scenes as to what is uh, a minimum. I know there'll be questions um, um, uh, about about that. Um, it was essential that actually before we had obviously guidance, which was voluntary, um, but this is about actually yeah, let's make this law um, um, let's ensure it's statutory. So um, parents and carers, and very importantly, children. Um, um, have that have that voice in terms of the school community. That's always going to be the first point of call uh, with the governors and the and the head teacher, but right up to um, essentially the, the the secretary of state in terms of that check and balance. Introducing um, competition was very important as well to um, to drive down costs. So single supplier um, um, arrangements will be sub subject to a, um, a tendering process. I know there be already has been considerable um, um, correspondence about that with the with the department. I know there'll be questions about about that today. Uh, there is a transitional um, um, period. This has taken two years, like I say, because of COVID bumps in the road, and we just got it across the line. And, 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 thank, and thanks again to uh, certainly the Children's Society, all the parents and all the campaigners um, um, that ensured that um, Rhys Mogg, who was then leader of the, of, the, of the House, was politely bombarded with social media, who, who then subsequently, you know, in all honesty, became very helpful. He, he ensured that we, we managed to get this just across the, across the line. Um, um, look, I... Um, I will have already seen schools responding um, um, to the requirements in the law. It is now the law. Of course, there's a transitional period. I've always got my local schools who actually many of them making a point of, of, of how well they're responding, which is brilliant. Uh, I've seen swap shops um, um, or you know, people who are rebranding re re them as sustainable and recycling swap shops emerge that to emerge across the country, being shown um, um, good examples. Um, um, so I'm I'm wholly hand by the response in terms of the school community. Um, there's certainly, despite the fact that I know the DfE have put guidance out there to head teachers, principals, and and, and governors, um, and we still more work to do in terms of um, promoting requirements of the law and the, and the time frame. Um, um, there are some schools, 
I will be frank that I'm not playing ball and I will do my bit as a politician um, and with others. I will say this is cross-party. This, of course, now it became a, a, a government piece of, of, of legislation to ensure that people are nudged in the right direction to do the right thing for children most in need. But lastly, thank you to everybody, to the Children's Society, the children in particular who've been uh, superb. DFE, absolutely um, 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 fantastic as well. I know at times it would have been uh, uh, frustrating. And I know that you've got to ensure that those provisions are now put in place. Thank you. And thank you so much, Mike. Um, and if I can introduce Asmina, um, who's a policy manager who's been working on our poverty work and um, talk a little bit about um, the work that she's been leading on this. Brilliant. Thanks, Freya. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. My name is Esmina. I'm a policy manager at the Children's Society. As Mike um, and Mark have both touched on, this has been a huge piece of work um, with many stakeholders. And as you heard from Mark, our work in this has really been rooted in what young people have told us. And our research in this has been rooted in what parents told us. So we undertook surveys in 2015, 2018, and again in 2020, to ask parents about how much money they were spending on school uniforms and the impact that it was having on their families. Um, Mike already touched on the costs themselves, but really the thing we kept hearing was that parents thought this was three times more than what they felt was reasonable to spend on uniform costs. And it was the impacts on their children that were really worried us. For example, we heard that nearly a quarter of children had gone to school wearing ill-fitting, unclean or unsuitable uniform because their parents just couldn't afford the right uniform. One in eight families told us that they had cut back on food and essentials to be able to afford uniform. And for lower income families, that was one in five families that had cut back. I should say that this survey was done before the pandemic um, and before the cost of living crisis that we're seeing right now. So I imagine those impacts are a lot higher. So this bill and the change that comes with it, I should say this act and the change that comes with it um, couldn't be more important to us. Mike also mentioned that the cost of uniform has an impact on the schools that parents choose for their children. And we found this in our survey as well. Around 7% of parents said that they didn't pick a certain school for their child because of the school uniform costs. So with all of these impacts that you know, are so negative, when actually an affordable uniform can be a very positive thing, we're so happy that the law was changed and we've been so grateful to work with everyone on this. But enough of me talking about what was the past. Hopefully what will happen now is that the guidance will be put in place Schools and parents will be able to look at this and will really be able to reap the benefits for parents and students. And the people who can really help us do that and help you do that as well um, are our friends and colleagues of the Department for Education. I'm so grateful that they've made the time to be here today. We've worked very closely with them on this. And as Mike has mentioned already, this really wouldn't have been possible with all the hard work behind the scenes. Um, so without further ado, I would love to introduce Alice Douglas and Alison Hardacre from the Department for Education, who will be able to provide a bit more detail on the ins and outs of what the guidance means for you. Thank you. Thank you, Asmina. Like everyone else here, we know that school uniform needs to be affordable for parents. No family should ever be put off from, a, from applying for or attending a school of their choice because of the cost of the uniform, which is why we were so pleased to work with Mike Ainsbury on his important private members bill, which enabled us to put in place the statutory guidance on the cost of school uniform, which was published in November. We were also really grateful for the support and the insight provided by the Children's Society, which really helped inform our thinking on the development of that guidance. The aim of this guidance is to support schools to put the cost considerations for parents front and centre when they're taking decisions about their school uniform. Many of the people we talk to in developing the guidance emphasise the importance of having a school uniform, to act as a social leveller, to establish a common ethos, set an appropriate tone for teaching and learning and to support safeguarding in schools. But in order to really achieve these benefits, school uniform must be affordable for parents and that feels even more important now than ever. So we're, we're really pleased to be here today to be able to talk in a bit more detail about what the guidance says, what schools should be doing now to ensure the cost of their uniform is reasonable. Um, I'll hand over to Ali and on to um, our slides. Thank you. 
Um, so our aim for the guidance was to ensure that the cost of school uniform is reasonable and secures best value for money for parents, whilst also enabling schools to sort of continue to make effective decisions in their local context, knowing the needs of their pupils and their local community. Um, so our aim with the guidance was to provide a clear framework within which we wanted schools to operate um, in order to try and make uniform more affordable for families of all backgrounds. Um, as Mike has said, the guidance is statutory which means that schools and governing boards must have regard to it when developing and implementing their school and trust uniform policies. And it covers a number of key areas and considerations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I've picked out some of the key points that I thought it was important to highlight today based on the activity that I think schools may currently be undertaking as they're reviewing their policy in the wake of the guidance being issued. Um, so firstly, in considering the cost of this, their uniform, um, schools will need to be thinking about the total cost of the school uniform, taking into account all items of uniform or clothing that parents will need to provide while their child is at the school. And we really want schools to think broadly here. So not just about the sort of everyday classroom wear, but also about their PE kit, about any other sort of subject requirements, as well as issues such as where parents may need to purchase multiple items or the impact where requirements change as a child moves through the school. Um, the guidance is also clear that schools should keep the use of branded items to a minimum and limit their cost, their use to low cost or long lasting items. And this is important because generic items which are widely available give parents choice and allow them to control the cost of their uniform. And it's worth noting as well that branded items are defined in the guidance not just as items with a logo, but as any item with distinctive characteristics that make it unique to the school or trust. Um, so, for example, a jumper with particular colour trim, which therefore cannot be bought from a range of retailers. Um, another important theme of the guidance is about the involvement of parents um, and ensuring that they are appropriately informed and engaged in the process. Um, so two key examples we've put on the slides here that are brought out in the guidance are that schools should engage with parents and pupils when they're developing their school uniform policy. And that's so important in helping schools understand parents and pupils needs and concerns and being able to sort of consider those and build them in whilst they're developing their policy and supply arrangements so that they're fit for purpose for parents. Um, and also the guidance is clear that um, the school's uniform policy, once it's been developed, should be published on the school's website, be available for all parents, including parents of prospective pupils, and be easily understood. Um, and I think it's important um, to be really clear in a policy about, um, about the requirements. It gives greater control to parents um, so they can understand which items are compulsory or optional, for example, and whether they need to buy things. And also, you know, issues such as if certain items are only needed at a particular time of year, that means parents can sort of spread the cost of their uniform, can buy items only when they're needed so that, parent, uh, so that their children don't grow out of them. Um, if we move on to the next slide, Freya. Thank you. Um, so importantly, as, been, as has been mentioned, schools also need to give careful consideration to cost in their uniform supply arrangements. Um, so as branded items should be kept to a minimum, most items should be able to be bought from, from a wide range of stores. Um, and we're also requiring schools to ensure that second-hand uniforms are available for parents to acquire. Um, Schools don't have to set up something bespoke there if they're already effective, accessible local schemes. Um, but it's sort of it's parents. Have, actually, some schools have told us that this has been a really positive move with their pupils, with their student body, um, not just for cost reasons, but also with for the importance of sort of sustainability factors as well. Um, and once again, just being really clear to parents the information on on what's available in terms of secondhand uniform and how they can access it. Um, but obviously we do appreciate that for branded items some schools may need a specific supplier and so schools should ensure that their supplier arrangements give the highest priority to cost and value for money for parents which might also involve taking account of factors such as the quality and durability of garments um, and again it's important to have a really good understanding of parents views and needs in order to inform that. 
um, we specify that single supplier contracts should be avoided unless these are regularly competitively tendered, where more, more than one supplier can compete for the contract and where the best value for money is secured, and that those contracts should be retendered regularly, so at least every five years. Um, again, the value of the contract will inform the type of procurement procedure needed for this. A low value contract might require just seeking three quotes um, from local suppliers or a high value contract might require a sort of full tendering exercise. Um, so that's a, a quick whistle stop tour of some of the key features of the guidance. I haven't covered everything, so I do encourage you to take a look at the guidance itself to see the sort of background detail to this and some of the other elements that are, that are covered in that. Um, but for now, I'll hand back to Alice to say a few words about what schools should be doing right now to take this forward. Thank you. Thank you. And can we move on to the next slide, please, Freya? Thank you. So the guidance sets out clear timelines for schools to put this into practice. No school is required to make a sudden drastic change to the uniform. I think because we're concerned this could actually have the potential to increase the financial burden on parents, if, especially if they've just bought a whole load of uniform. But we do need schools to recognise the impact of uniform costs on parents, particularly in the current context, and to take action now. Therefore, by this September, schools should be compliant with much of the guidance. That means before parents are, are starting to acquire items this summer, schools should have reviewed their uniform policy to see if any changes are required, and that should include talking to parents and pupils. They should have made any necessary change to the uniform policy, such as removing an unnecessary branded item. Of course, in doing so, it's important that this doesn't breach a pre-existing agreement with their supplier, particularly if that supplier may already have bought the stock. Schools should have published the uniform policy on the website and ensured it's easily understood. And schools should have made secondhand uniform available for parents to acquire. So those are all things happening, starting to happen now for this summer. Whereas school needs to run a competitive process to set a new set up a new contract to support, secure a supplier for elements of the uniform, for example, if they didn't have a contract or an agreement in place, they will need to ensure they have a clear plan to make this to meet this requirement as soon as possible. Um, as Ali said, the size of the contract um, will vary. Will depend. The size of the contract will impact what process they'll need to take place, and therefore that will impact how long it will take them to do this. But we're saying that contract should be in place no later than this December, and that will allow suppliers to provide that new uniform for the summer of 2023. Therefore, schools should be fully compliant with the guidance by summer 2023. And we know schools are already taking steps to take this, put this into practice. And it's it's one thing that's so great to see so many people signing up for this webinar because that's part of schools thinking about how they're gonna how they're gonna do this. So it's really good to see. We've been really pleased to see examples of schools thinking about a change they need to make and talking to their their parents and their school school community to ensure their appraisals are meeting parents' needs. Thank you, Freya. And thank you very much to you both um, for presenting that in such a clear fashion. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions for you. So looking forward to the Q&A and hopefully we'll answer a few more of those questions. Um, we've also produced um, like a little handy one pager, which I think my colleague Jake just put in the chat. So that's useful for anyone to kind of share around with colleagues, share around the school if they just want to give people a bit of an introduction to what that means. Um, thank you so much, Alice and Alison. Um, and I'll just um, hand over to um, my colleagues uh, Georgina and Francesca, who've been working really closely at uh, CPAG and at Children Northeast. Thanks, Freya. Uh, great, thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this afternoon and taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, we really appreciate it. So I'm just going to start off um, by giving a quick introduction to Children North East and Child Poverty Action Group so you can understand how we've got to where we are today. Um, so Poverty Proof in the School Day is a programme that was developed in 2011 by Children North East and we consulted with children and young people who told us if there was one thing we could do about child poverty to make a difference to their lives it would be that we should do something about the school day because that was the one place where it was most noticeable you lived in poverty. So we developed a programme to speak to every pupil in the school about their experience of the school day. Child Poverty Action Group then took the learning from Children North East and they developed the cost of the school day and started delivery of that in Glasgow in 2014. Um, then in early 2020, uh, both organisations joined together their expertise to deliver UK cost of the school day 
um, which we are delivering in certain local authorities in England, Scotland and Wales. So one of the things that we have heard time and time again from um, our projects is that pupils and parents will tell us how difficult they find the cost of school uniform. But we do know the difference that affordable and inclusive uniform policies can make. And while the broader issue of poverty is one that's a lot more complex than what we could cover today, um, some really straightforward and practical actions that schools can take. So we're just going to give you some examples of approaches that um, we've seen schools take uh, to make uniform more affordable. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Thank you very much. Um, so the first um, <clears throat> element of around uniform policies is keeping branding to a minimum can really help to reduce costs for families. So lots of schools have already took action to reduce the number of right branded items that are needed, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, <clears throat> but where branding is necessary, maybe on a school jumper or blazer, um, we've seen schools make so on badges available. So a uniform can still be purchased from a wide range of affordable suppliers and then can be personalised at a later date um, with the logo. And that just means that families aren't having to purchase from one particular uh, designated supplier, which can um, make it more expensive. Which brings me on to the next point, um, which is around suppliers. So when you are reviewing your suppliers, um, think about what the total cost of the uniform is, including delivery options. So sometimes there can be a delivery charge um, if families are buying those online. And the other thing to think about is how easy it is for families to access the supplier. So what are the opening hours? Where is the shop located? And are there public transport links for families who don't have access to a car? So some ways around that um, that we've seen is that some suppliers will host a pop-up shop um, within the school community, maybe at a parent's evening, or uh, end of term, sort of last day of term events where families can access the uniform more easily. And finally, just um, a thing to think about when you are communicating about any changes. So for example, you're making changes this September, uh, you need to co start consulting with your families about that now so that they've got time to think about these changes and what that means in terms of budget. And so some schools, um, that we've worked with when they've been making changes to their uniform and um, there's been a bit of a transition period so um, not everybody's had to buy a new uniform at the same time they'll just phase it out and that means that families aren't having to purchase uniform um, or, or replace uniform that is good quality and spend money um, unnecessarily on the new uniform. And the final point around communicating this is um, we found that it find works best when families are communicated with in a range of different ways. So one communication method might work for one family, but it might not necessarily work for another family. And um, so that's just something to bear in mind as well. So if you can move on to the next slide, please, Freya, and I'll hand over to Georgina. Thank you. So we've already heard that making sure that um, second hand, or as we would call it, pre-loved uniform provision is a part of the statutory guidance now and some practical ways we've seen schools do this so I think the first thing is to consider how you can make it consistently available to pupils and families we see schools do really great things at parents evening and school fairs where pre-love provision is made available but actually children go at different rates and might require new uniform at different points in the school year so we've seen some schools that have set up a rail or a drop box um, in reception areas of the school or spaces frequently accessed by students and parents where they can not only leave uniform that they no longer need, but can take any uniform that they might require as well. Other schools have linked up with other community organisations like community centres, charity shops, religious venues, anywhere in your community that parents are readily going to access. It might be within your school, but actually it could be somewhere elsewhere in the community. We have also seen schools that have trialled um, having a designated email address that parents can email specifically if they require some support with, uh, with uniform or would like some pre-loved provision. So there's a direct route just to talk about uniform as an issue. 
The other thing we've seen schools do or would encourage schools to consider is how students that are transitioning get access to pre-love provision. So we've seen, for example, on year seven open evenings that that pre-love provision is available for year six children and families to be able to help themselves to. We've also seen schools when year 11 leave that year 11 are encouraged to, if they don't have younger siblings, leave their blazers and ties that they're not going to use again. Then there's a great stop there in school for the following year. And again, to encourage year six, if you're a primary school, if they don't have younger siblings, also, let's collect them as we move into the summer term, and it's a good way of getting that pre-love provision ready in school. Our GFE colleagues mentioned that getting students involved in this and talking about it from an environmental perspective, as well as that money saving point of view, really makes a difference. And to think about the language I use, and pre-love definitely works over second hand, sometimes a small difference, but really does address some of that stigma that might be um, associated with this. Make it desirable. We've seen some really great work with eco councils and schools taking the lead on, on, on pre-love provision. Thank you for next slide please and as we heard about earlier um think more broadly about uniform in terms of total cost including PE kit um again DFE colleagues mentioned this around making the clear distinction between compulsory and optional PE kit and clothing we've heard from lots of parents that they might purchase football boots and shin pads and they're used for one half term when they do that particular activity but we have seen schools that will have um, a stock of these available, a loan system, so that families don't need to buy them, but everybody can still take part in those particular sports. Make sure that that distinction is made clear, particularly when we're thinking about indoor and outdoor clothing, how many layers they actually need for outdoor and how frequently they're going to be used so that parents can make informed decisions. We have seen some schools that have used both pupil premium and sports premium to purchase PE kit items for, for children and keep those PE kits in school so that they are always there. Some schools, and I appreciate not all, will have uh, the resource or facilities to do this, wash and launder those PE kits and, like I said, keep them permanently in school so they're always available. Um, we worked with one school that gave all families a PE kit um, when the um, when their parents returned the pupil premium eligibility form. So actually that PE kit didn't cost the school any money because they had uh, their full pupil premium entitlement and everybody had the PE kit that they needed. So it was a, a, an, an all round positive situation for both the school and for families. And lastly, just if you are um, sort of making spare kit available as it should be so that nobody's missing out on practical lessons, consider how it's, how it's presented we've seen some really great practice again with well stocked and well presented rails of a PE kit in appropriate size and rather than just the random things that have sort of been left over from students to lessen that stigma the other thing is if a student is frequently without either uniform or PE kit is that being used to have a broader conversation with families about any support that they might need at the moment is there monitoring of that taking place to make sure that if it is on a regular regular basis that, um, th that it's used as a discussion point with families. And lastly, Freya, if you want to go to just the last slide, and I'll just wrap up before I hand back to Francesca, I guess what we'd like to say from both uh, uh, Poverty Proofing and Cost of the School Day is that it's really great what's been done with Uniform. Uniform is um, one school cost families are facing uh, among lots more as well so we would encourage you as part of an exploration of, of uniform and, and cost families are facing to also look at the, the overall cost of the school day I guess and what we're asking families for so I will hand back to Freya to uh, to make introductions to our next speaker uh, sorry Francesca um thanks Georgina and um, so uh, yeah, if you if you do want to get in touch with us, um, I think there will be some contact details shared um, on the slides that I've sent around afterwards as well. And um, we'd love to hear from anyone who's uh, doing taking different approaches um, to support families with uniform costs at their school. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to Keith Rondo, who is a head teacher at St Mark's Primary School in Dudley. Uh, children northeast of Ypres, St Mark's, back in 2019, um, and one of the areas that the school had some great practice around was their uniform. So I'm going to hand over to Keith, who's going to talk a little bit more about what they're doing to support families with 
your forecast. Thank you. Um, and first and foremost, I'm a serious, a serious thanks for having me here today. And it's great to hear so many colleagues committed to, to supporting families and children. Um, yeah, as you heard, I'm, I'm head teacher of St Mark's uh, in Pensnet Dudley. Uh, we are, currently have about 45% of children uh, in receipts of the pupil premium here, uh, but we have over 50% of the community that we serve who are identified as living in poverty. Um, before I start talking about uniform, I really want to echo Georgina's final point, which is that it's important to uh, understand that a school stance on uniform should be part of a much wider and coherent approach, which is poverty informed. And by having an open dialogue about poverty, disadvantage in money, families feel that they can access the support, including uniform, in a way that maintains dignity and respect. But in terms of uniform, um, here at St Mark, something that, that we, we uh, do really is we have absolutely zero expectation that children wear a uniform with a school badge on it. Uh, in fact, I positively encourage families to buy uniform without the school badge on it. Um, and there are absolutely zero consequences for children if they are wearing something that isn't strictly school uniform. We want children in schools feeling valued and safe and ready to learn. And actually, if it is an ongoing problem, we understand as a school that it might be a symptom of a bigger problem. So sensitively and thoughtfully, we will approach the family and check that everything is OK. Um, we've also provided a £15 voucher uh, to, to all children for families to spend on uniform. And that was a one off. We, we had made a saving uh, due to the first lockdown, but we thought that the money should be spent on the children and uniform was, was a, a key thing that we wanted to address. But the main thing that really supports parents is the pre-loved uniform that, that is free for everybody to access every single day throughout the whole year. Um, we, we have some lovely IKEA Calax units in the main reception area where we have shirts and jumpers and trousers, dresses, PE kit, et cetera, et cetera. They're all stored there. And these have been washed and ironed with staff and we really make the effort for it to look neat and tidy and presentable. Um, and, and as I say, um, parents and families can access these at any time of the day. You know, they don't need to, to ask for permission. They just walk in through the main doors and it's there. They just come in and take what they want when they need it. And we also have a, a large laundry basket in the reception area as well. And so parents can make donations and these get taken home by staff, as I said earlier on and they're washed and they're ironed and we make sure that the boxes are replenished. I think it's important to say that parents collect the uniform for a variety of reasons. There's always that child who somehow manages to lose three jumpers in the space of one week and they just need something to tide them over until payday or some children just have a growth spurt out of nowhere and need a jumper to get them through winter or, or a PE kit to get them through the last two weeks of, of the academic year. But it's important to say it's as and when it is needed for whatever purpose, but it's there for families to, to access. I think one thing that we will be doing next term, which we haven't done yet, is we know that some of our parents will not even step inside the school to, to access that provision. Such are their own experiences of education and establishments and people of authority. So we're planning to invest in um, some clothes rails and hangers and have the clothes set outside at home time on specific days when the weather's good. And we hope that by mimicking the presentation of the shop and having it outside, it will mean that absolutely everybody will feel comfortable and can access the provision. Um, and then I think for me to, to finish off on really it is to say that I think that you know, the, the change in the guidance is hugely important and positive. You know, education is a right and uniform should not be an obstacle to that. Um, Luke Bramble from Children North East talked about being an easy to reach school. And I think the approach to uniform is, is absolutely central to that. And that's me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Keith, um, and Francesca and Georgina as well. Um, it's really good to kind of have a combination. We've got Mark and Mike talking about the campaigns and how we've made political change. And we've got Alison and Alison as Mina being this kind of amazing policy experts. And then we're hearing from you about what it's really like on the ground 
talking to children, working with families. Um, and I really hope that everyone's kind of got a lot to learn here from all of that range of experiences. So we've got about 15 minutes, 20 minutes if people want to stay on for another minute or two um, to do a bit of a QA and a now. Um, so if everyone in the who's participating in the panel would be happy to kind of turn their cameras on uh, and we can turn this into a panel discussion. Um, and what I'll be doing is I'll be kind of pointing at people and asking people some questions um, and suggesting you know, who might be interested in coming in. And um, we've had quite a few different questions coming through the, the Q&A box um, and we had a few more submitted in advance as well. So we're going to try and kind of bring a few of them together um, so we can hopefully answer more than one person's question at once. Um, also, what we'll do is any questions that we get that we haven't answered in the session, we're going to take away, look at them, make sure we've got really robust answers to them and then send them back to you guys as well with the recording, hopefully in the next few days. So hopefully everyone should be covered. Um, so one question that we've got that I wanted to start with, um, and potentially it's a good question to start potentially with Keith, um, and then maybe, um, I don't know if um, CPAG, c &E or DFE wants to come in on it. Um, it's a question from Catherine, who says that she's a parent governor, and she's really, really interested in hearing your views on the best ways to engage a diverse group of parents and carers in uniform consultations. Um, and I wonder if anyone had any experience on that or any advice for Catherine. Uh, I'm going to throw that at you, Keith, first, if that's okay. Um, I think it's really important that uh, schools find a mechanism that allows them to truly give their school community um, a voice. Um, so I know CPAG, they um, have got the cost of the, um, the, the, the school day audit. That toolkit is a really, really powerful document that I would refer um, school leaders to look at. You know, we were poverty proofed as a school where, you know, every single child was spoken to. Um, and yeah, parents were consulted through that, and that gave us a really strong understanding uh, of where our community was at and, and how we could support them. I think they're two great places to start, but absolutely a mechanism that, that gives all of your community an, an honest voice, a sincere voice, absolutely. That's fantastic, Keith. Does anyone else want to come in on that before we move? Uh, Georgina? Right. Uh, Francesco and I were just reading about a school that we worked with previously this week where um, the, 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 jump, the colour of the jumpers had originally been maroon and a, a parent said they were finding it tricky to get the maroon colour from the, the range of local suppliers. So they first um, did a discussion with their parent forum and from the parent forum they said actually we'd like them to be blue because they're easier to purchase from the supermarket. So before they went ahead with that, because that parent form was a good starting point, but it was just a small selection and there was a reason for the maroon, it had been there quite a while and lots of other things. At parents' evening, they literally had a box with two, um, for, you know, for people to put coins in, whether they wanted maroon or blue. So everybody that attended parents' evening had an opportunity to say whether or not they wanted to stick with the maroon, which had been part of the school historically, or if they preferred the blue. Now, I know that's really straightforward because that's just about colour and actually we're talking about much more complex things here but I think it's about providing opportunities for everybody to be heard around consultation and also um, that might mean using lots of different methods so you might use parent forums but you might also want a text message survey just to make sure that yeah any barriers that families might face in engaging with a consultation that there are a range of different ways that they can have an opportunity to give some feedback. Uh, thank you so much for that, Georgina and Keith. Um, I've got a similar question, which I wonder if you'd be happy to answer, Alicia, which is about, do you think there's any good ways that schools can be talking to young people about school uniform? I know that you and me, we've talked a bit before about sometimes just the context of school uniform chats are already stressful before they even start. So anything that you've kind of got to say about how schools could maybe yeah, listen to young people's voices about what they want from their school uniform? Yeah, so I mean, something that happened when I was in my sixth form was they were changing the like the secondary school uniform, and something that was really important was in like the form time and stuff like that. Rather than having like a big assembly being like, oh, we're thinking of changing the policy, they actually sat down like senior members of the team, so senior leadership were going into forms and saying, right, we've got propositions. Which of these propositions are you completely? nope you don't like which of these do you want us to take to the drawing board again and then which of these are you like yep thumbs up you're happy with it and giving like young people the option so they can so instead of coming straight away with a this is what we're going to do this is it coming round with the so you're working together because that is what you want you don't just because otherwise it's not going to work as a policy you need to work together for it to work from both sides of it 
Thanks so much, Alicia. For, that's a really great, really excellent example. I'm really glad that you were able to talk about really good things that you'd seen happen in your school, as well as sometimes, you know, more stressful moments. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is kind of a bit of an amalgamation. We've had quite a lot of questions on this theme. Um, and I'm going to aim this one at DFE, if that's OK, which is we're having quite a lot of people say, you know, I'm still seeing my child's school has a really expensive uniform or I've asked them if they're changing. They said they're not changing, but they, I, don't, they, I don't feel like they're doing enough. And they're just kind of wondering, you know, what is the level of um, kind of obligation or legality? You know, where can schools be challenged or how can they have a really constructive conversation with schools if parents and community groups like uh, clothing banks still think that schools maybe aren't quite going far enough and aren't being quite as fair as they could be um yeah DFE if you'd be happy to answer that that'd be great yes very happy to answer that so I suppose the first thing I'd say is that we're still in the transition implementation phase so uh schools should be taking steps to comply but they're not they, they won't all be at the stage where they're fully compliant yet but this is this guidance is, is statutory. Schools do need to comply with it unless they have a very good reason not to. And it is, you know, it does have that statutory basis. If parents are worried about whether their school is planning on complying or is compliant, first thing, just talk to the school. Just um, the hopefully the first conversa conversations can be easily resolved by just sort of pointing them in the direction of the guidance and saying, you know, what what are your plans to deal with this? If after all, if that after that parents have concerns, and there is all schools do have a formal complaint process. That, can, that the parent can follow and if and ultimately if having gone through that process the parent is concerned or someone else is concerned that the school um, isn't able to meet isn't meeting its obligations then there's the opportunity to complain to the DfE but we very much hope these situations can be resolved at a at a, at a kind of a, a, a local and encouraging level I think by pointing the school in the right direction. Thank you very much. Um, Alice, for that reflection, I think that's important to urge uh, that though we really want this to be a really positive change and we're hoping it's going to happen, there will be some adjustment time before we can really see that kind of full realisation happen. Um, that was a question we actually had come through as well is, is there kind of plans for kind of research or follow up to see if, if things are changing, kind of how the, how the pace of things are changing? Um, that's something we'll be considering for the future, but the moment the focus at the moment is um, encouraging schools to make the changes they need um, for, for parents in the next year. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so I've got another question, which is around um, from a grandparent who says that um, their child is quite, or their grandchildren are quite often getting trouble for not having the right school uniform, and it's not, not really very very good. It's not making them feel very happy and comfortable in school. Um, and I wondered if um, maybe Keith and maybe some other panelists had some advice on how schools can see a pupil who's not kind of following the uniform for one reason or another, and what's the kind of best response to make sure that you're not. Um, potentially, you know, punishing a young person who's in a situation they can't get out of because of their family's income. Um, Keith, did you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I think that tr trying to arrange a meeting um, with somebody within the school, if it's secondary ahead of year, I think is quite ideal. Um, and just trying to articulate the difficulties that the, that the family is having and, and, you know, put the ball in the school's court in terms of what support can they offer in that regard and quote the guidance to them, you know, schools have a responsibility to, to make sure the uniform is, is accessible. Um, but I think that that dialogue is, is truly important, um, you know, and if the family can um, get that started, it can only be a good thing. And do you have any advice um, to schools themselves in, you know, whether there's any adaptations they might want to make to their behaviour policy or just kind of conversations to have with staff about how they support young people who <laughs> maybe aren't coming up, coming in with the right uniform? Yeah, absolutely. I think my advice for school is that we need to understand that, as I mentioned, that quite often when children are coming into school and they're not exactly following the, the school's preferred policy for uniform, that Quite often it's not because it's a minor act of rebellion, quite often it's a symptom of a larger problem that is happening and that actually the school should take an empathetic approach where they're looking to work with the family to see if there are any difficulties in empathetic, sympathetic way and, and support them to overcome them challenges because ultimately the child wants to be in school and wants to be successful. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, and this one's a question for um, Asmina and Mark, whoever will be more keen to talk about it. Um, in some ways, you know, a big battle has been won. The 
the, the law's been passed, the guidance has been passed. Um, is there a role that you see um, the Children's Society playing in kind of continuing this work in this area or moving into other work around uh, schools or uniforms or, or school poverty in school? I'm happy to jump in, although I would welcome Mark's thoughts as well. Just to say that, you know, our campaign around this started with what young people told us and was affecting their ability to really get the most out of their education. Um, of course, there's been some big wins, but we don't think the, the work is done. As we can see, there's a lot left for schools to do, a lot left for parents to gain. Um, and we'll keep engaging with parents and young people to make sure that this is implemented. And if parents and students say to us in the next few years, actually, we haven't seen the benefit of this, we'll continue doing work, we'll go back to the drawing board and make sure um, that this can be implemented and parents can feel the benefits of this change in law. Similarly, you know, we do so much work around the area of child poverty, whether that's around free school meals, whether that's to make sure that children from migrant families who may not have the same rights as others have access to. So school uniform is just one small, small part of the work that we do, and we'll continue to engage with young people to make sure um, that we're really fighting for them to have access to the basic resources. Thank you so much, Asmina. So we're going to go with one final question. Um, if that's OK, um, which is that we had a shout out from the Leeds um, kind of community um, school uniform exchange. And they were talking about the kind of great work that they were seeing in terms of the council supporting local community groups to work with schools and provide a kind of um, pre used, uh, pre loved uniform service. Um, and I was just wondering um, if anyone had any thoughts on that. Um, around um yeah kind of supporting community groups to engage but i do have just been informed that i cut over mark and that's because there is a little little pop-up box that's currently covering up mark's face on my screen i didn't realize he was, like, was looking to speak mark did you want to come in first sorry about that no i was saying i didn't want to come in i think um asmina's answer was absolutely spot on but what the children's society will continue to work with our friends and government and and to bring the issues that young people are telling us from our frontline work to try and fight for further change to help families who are facing a really tough time right now but I think what you just shared from what's happening in Leeds sounds absolutely fantastic. And it's just the kind of example that we're hoping to see more of around the country, which will provide families with the help and the support that they need. Thank you very much, Mark. And again, sorry for speaking in front of you. I've got a lot of pop-up boxes currently floating around my screen. Um, quickly, maybe, um, CPAC's d &E, I know that you were talking about a couple of different local authorities that you've done some really good partnerships with. I didn't know if you wanted to maybe give a shout out to them as examples of best practice in terms of communities working together with schools and with councils um, and maybe with DfV could consider whether that's an area of work kind of to look at is the role that councils are playing already in this. Yes, Georgina. Um, yeah, we're, 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 we're working with schools like Francesca said across England, so we see various things in terms of the, the role of, of local authorities um, and not just local, you know, local authorities, but also trusts being really proactive around this as well so any routes or ways of chatting about this with schools we, we yeah we've got a range of different uh evidence on good practice great thank you so much um unless anyone's keen to respond to that question further i think we can wrap it up there and try and stick to our original 5 30 finish time but what we'll do is we'll take away all the questions that we haven't answered as i said um and kind of make sure we've got full and complete responses to those to come back to you um with the recording and thank you so much everyone who joined us today and again as we said took times out of, out of your diaries i think we had a peak of about 200 participants which is just fantastic um so thank you so much everyone uh, and feel free to head off um and potentially panellists, we can just stick around um, towards the end, just to check in with everyone and see how everyone found that session. Um, but thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. And I hope you have a good uh, Wednesday evening. It's pouring with rain here uh, down in Cornwall. I hear that it's sunny and warm in London, but it is absolutely not here. And um, thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Um,